Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Hannah Kern. And as Brittany mentioned, I will be updating you on recent developments in state and federal law. So we're going to start out by talking about the Washington Silence No More Act. This is a law that prohibits agreements between employers and their employees or independent contractors, which say that the employee or the independent contractor may not discuss things like illegal harassment, discrimination, retaliation, wage and hour violations, sexual assault, and the like. This law went into effect June 9th, 2022, so a very recent law. It is broadly applicable. It applies to all employers with employees in Washington state, and it applies to agreements between employers and their current or former or prospective employees, and then hiring entities and same, their current, former, or prospective independent contractors. So no threshold for the number of employees in this one. Even if you only have one employee in Washington state, it applies to that employee. Um, what kind of agreements are we talking about here? So the kinds of agreements that are commonly at issue are uh, pre-employment agreements such as hire, you know, when, you're, when you're hiring someone, right, their employment agreement, um, sometimes confidentiality, uh, non-disclosure agreements might have terms that would be violative of this law. And then at the end of um, employment, um, separation agreements, severance agreements, and things like that. So employers cannot contract around this law by saying that the law of a different state will apply. If the employee or the independent contractor is in Washington, then the law does apply. All right, let's talk a little bit more about what employers can't do under this law. So you cannot ask an employee to sign an agreement that says that they will not disclose this alleged conduct. Um, they can't be prohibited from disclosing conduct that they reasonably believe to be illegal discrimination, retaliation, etc. in the workplace. So it also applies to conduct that is recognized as being violative of a clear mandate of public policy, um, and they cannot be precluded from talking about the existence of a settlement. Retaliation is also prohibited, so employers are not permitted from discharging, discriminating, or retaliating against employees for making these kinds of disclosures. Um, re the retroactive effect is an important thing to think about. So you might be thinking, well, I have a lot of agreements that predate June 9th. Do I have to go and look at every single one of those and revise them? The answer to that is no. So there is no liability just for an agreement that exists if it was entered into before June 9th with a very important caveat, and that is you can't enforce it. So if you try to enforce an agreement that predates June 9th, there could be liability. As far as new agreements go, you wanna be really careful that these kinds of terms, these kinds of prohibitions are not there. What can employers prohibit employees from disclosing? So you can prohibit disclosure of the amount of the settlement. So a dollar amount that was paid in settlement to settle some kind of claim like this, you can prohibit disclosure of that. You cannot prohibit disclosure of the fact of settlement. And you can continue to protect things like your trade secrets, um, proprietary information, and your, con your confidences. So as far as consequences, entering into that new agreement or even asking an employee to enter into that new agreement um, could result in liability. The act provides for a civil cause of action. So that means the employee or independent contractor could sue you. Um, and the act provides for a minimum damages award of $10,000 plus the um, attorney's fees and costs that the employee incurs. So, so some teeth there to the law. So what, what's your takeaway from this? You may have standard offer letters, standard confidentiality agreements, um, standard severance agreements that may contain non-disclosure and non-disparagement provisions. So those need to be reviewed. You have got to carefully consider the language that you put into your settlement agreements. Um, and one of the things, you know, one of the ways that, that this can be addressed is you put in an exclusionary paragraph in confidentiality or non-disparagement provision saying, notwithstanding the foregoing, this provision does not preclude the employee from disclosing and then listing the kinds of things that are protected under the law. And it is important to remember that these restrictions are applicable to independent contractors as well. All right, next, let's turn to the Washington Equal Pay 
and um, the pay transparency amendments to the Washington Equal Pay and Opportunities Act. So this is an amendment to the existing Washington Equal Pay and Opportunities Act, and it requires Washington employers to disclose salary ranges or wage scales and benefits in their job postings. So let's start out with who does it apply to? Employers with 15 or more employees, and we'll talk a little bit more about how those are counted. And this law goes into effect coming up January 1st, this coming January. So you've got a little bit of time, but it's time to start thinking about it and getting ready. So employers have to, as I said, disclose wage scales or salary ranges in their job postings. The job postings also have to include a general description of benefits and other compensation. There are uh, government enforcement possibilities, civil penalties. Um, the Department of Labor and Industries enforces this and may investigate and issue citations. And again, a private cause of action is an option for um, employees. So this is a page where I'm going to spend a fair bit of time because there are a lot of unanswered questions um, around this. So what benefits must be included? How detailed do you have to get as far as your benefit disclosure? The department has told us that a general description of benefits includes things like health care benefits, retirement benefits, benefits permitting days off. If you have a more generous sick leave policy than what's required under applicable law, that needs to be included. A leave accruals, parental leave, any other benefits that might be reported for um, tax purposes and um, fringe benefits, those kinds of things. There is guidance saying that an electronic link to a benefits page would meet this requirement. So if you have that, that could be one, one way to comply. Next, what is a job posting? It's broadly defined. It is any solicitation which is included, or I'm sorry, intended to recruit applicants for a specific available position that includes recruitment done directly by employers, as well as recruitment done by a third party recruiter for you. It includes postings that are actual physical postings, as well as electronic postings. It is not applicable to general help wanted ads. So we've all seen those ads where perhaps Amazon is advertising, you know, we hire great people. You don't have to provide wage scales and, and benefits in those. A simply help wanted sign in a window also does not apply to that. One thing to keep in mind is that these new disclosure requirements apply to outside external applicant job postings, not to internal transfers. There are other parts of the same act that require that you provide an internal person who's transferring or getting a promotion with um, that pay information upon request, but this applies to external job postings. So how about jobs that can be performed remotely, right? In this workforce, this day and age, we've got lots of folks that are working in, um, in other places. What if you are advertising for a position that could be performed in Washington or it could be performed elsewhere? So on that, the department has issued recently some draft guidance. They're looking for input. This is not the final guidance. And I'm going to tell you the draft guidance is a little confusing because it says that if someone is posting a job that could be performed in Washington, then you have to include this information. So you might be thinking, well, that's fine. I can just post my job and say, I'm not going to hire anyone in Washington. But the guidance specifically says that an employer may not avoid disclosing this information by indicating within a posting that the employer will not accept Washington applicants. Uh, you do not have to include this information if the job must be performed outside the state of Washington. For example, if an employer is hiring for a job site, a physical job site where the employee must be at that job site and that job site is outside the state of Washington. Um, hard copies of postings that are physically only posted outside the state of Washington do not have to comply, but if there's online postings that are accessible in Washington, they do have to comply. So one of the things that you know we look at for guidance is, is Colorado instituted a similar law that went in effect in January of 21. Um, we saw a decrease in employers posting job for jobs in Colorado. Um, however, those who did advertise in Colorado saw an uptick in applicants. So, so there it is for the, whatever that's worth. As far as how are your 15 employees calculated, they do not have to all be in Washington. So if you are an employer with 15 employees anywhere, but you have at least one of them in Washington, then the law applies to you. So 
takeaways on this one. Review your compensation structures now and be ready with your wage scales and your salary ranges because you will be putting those in your job postings come January 1. Consider conducting internal pay audits. You want to not be in a position where you are advertising wage scales that are higher than what you're paying your existing employees who are doing that same job, right? That's an employee relations nightmare. Um, And then, of course, train your managers, train the people who are making these decisions so that they are aware of the requirements of this law. Let's next talk about the Seattle Independent Contractor Protection Ordinance. This is an ordinance which provides some additional protections to independent contractors working in Seattle. And before those of you who are not located in Seattle, check out and go get your next cup of coffee. Be aware that if your independent contractor spends even part of their time working in Seattle, it applies even if the business that they are working for is located outside of the the city of Seattle. So to comply, employers must do two categories of things. They have to provide certain notices to independent contractors, and they have to timely pay their independent contractors. This is a very new ordinance, so it just went into effect. For existing independent contractors, you've got either till the end of September, so three more days, or by the date of compensation to provide these notices. When you're hiring new independent contractors, you have to provide these notices before they start their work. The ordinance is pretty broadly applicable. It applies to self-employed independent contractors that don't have employees who perform any part of their work in Seattle for a commercial hiring entity, and and they'll be um, reasonably expected to receive at least $600 in compensation. There are exceptions. Lawyers are excluded. Those whose relationships are due solely to a property rental agreement, such as a hairdresser renting a chair in a salon is the example that was given. So those kinds of relationships. Others can be excluded by rule if the director of the Office of Labor Standards finds they have adequate bargaining power. The indication there has been that those exceptions are going to be very narrow and will only be applied applicable to independent contractors that already have specific um, protections under other Seattle ordinances. So what do you have to do? You have to provide two types of notices, a notice of rights, and then a pre-work written notice that provides the contractor with certain information. My next slide, I'm going to pop up a link for you there. And that is where you can find exactly what these notices have to say. And, you know, a lot of this, what you have to say really is not rocket science. And it may be a lot of what you're saying already. It's things like um, how much you're going to pay them, what the rate of pay is. Are they paid um, by the hour, by the month, by the week, by the project? Who are you? Who are they? When are they going to pay? What's the work that they're going to do? There's a whole laundry list of things that you have to provide. And that is all um, in that link that you see on the web page there. Okay, I'm next going to talk briefly about the Washington Wage Recovery Act. This is a law that permits employees with a wage claim to put a lien on employer assets before they have gotten a judgment against you. So what this means is that if an employee with a wage claim files a suit, they can get um, a a hold basically placed on your assets. And that can be placed on real property, accounts receivable, your bank accounts, goods intangibles, what have you. So nothing, there's no mm, takeaway in terms of something we want employers to do at the moment. This is more a be aware. Uh, There are certain employer protections in the statute. Employers have to file the suit to foreclose the lien within eight months, so they can't just sit on it. Um, Employers can also post a bond and they're extinguish the lien in that way. So that's the takeaway here is just, just be aware. Plaintiff's attorneys certainly are aware, and so we expect to be seeing these kinds of liens. All right, I've got not a lot of time left, but I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some federal matters that we want to draw to your attention. Um, The first thing I want to talk to you about a little bit is health equity policies, which we're finding a lot of employers are interested or are exploring implementing. This arose as a result of the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case. As you probably know, this is the case where our Supreme Court overruled Roe v. Wade and held that states hold the power to regulate abortions with really very minimal um, judicial oversight. And this, of course, has opened the door to states restricting access to reproductive health care, which 
a number of states have done. So that's not news to most of you, I think, but what um, may be interesting to you is how are employers responding to this? Many employers are considering implementing what they call health equity policies. The idea that you, the employer will compensate their employees that are located in the states where they don't have access to reproductive health care to travel to states where they can obtain that care for themselves, perhaps for their families, and perhaps even to move, you know, providing expenses to help them move to a different state if they should choose to do so. So really the question um, surrounding this is, is what is this, what are the risks associated with this? What might employers have to consider if they'd like to implement this kind of policy? So the first thing that you want to do is check and see what your health care says about this, right? Because some of this might be covered under your existing health care plan for your employees. Um, there are certainly some risks, as many of you know, some of the states that have curtailed reproductive rights have imposed criminal liability and civil sanctions on someone aiding and abetting an abortion. It's a big unknown about whether they would go after out-of-state employers who are helping their employees within that state um, obtain that health care. How successful would those claims even be, considering that the employer is in a different state? You know, maybe there are jurisdictional issues there. But again, a, a big unknown, though that's a novel area. Certainly privacy concerns are something else to be thinking about. Um, at, employers have to be very circumspect in the type of healthcare and medical information they obtain and keep about their employees. You know, you don't want to tow over that line. Are you creating a healthcare plan? And if you're creating a healthcare plan, you know you have to start thinking about the Affordable Care Act, about ERISA, about HIPAA. Would the payments be taxable is another issue. Would there be violations of laws which require parity for mental health or substance abuse benefits? In other words, if you've got employees in jurisdictions where they maybe cannot obtain mental health or substance abuse care, would, you, is, would the laws require that you provide those travel benefits to those employees as well? So really no hard and fast answers on those issues, just kind of drawing your attention to what you need to be thinking about if you're considering those kinds of policies. I want to talk briefly about a case out of Oregon, Fraid versus University of Oregon, that has Equal Pay Act implications and disparate impact implications. So we're seeing an uptick in claims for a, of disparate impact. That is the idea where an employee alleges that the employer has a facially neutral policy, but that that policy has a disproportionate impact on a particular uh, protected class, which is not, and the policy is not justified by business necessity. So plaintiff Jennifer Freyd is a professor of psychology at U of O. She filed a complaint in court alleging that the university was paying sub her substantially less than her similarly situated male colleagues. She included several causes of action, including a disparate impact claim that arose out of the, po the university's policy and practice of issuing retention raises. The policy was facially neutral. Uh, faculty who are offered jobs elsewhere and who the university wants to retain may be offered a raise in order to entice them to stay. We see this in the private sector as well, right? So statistics show, though, that females are less likely to seek other work, they're less likely to receive other offers, and they're also less likely to seriously consider those offers. So Ms. Freyd alleged that there was a disparate impact as a result of this. So what, what happened in that case is um, the trial court granted summary judgment for the university. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals reversed that and sent it back for trial, but then the parties settled. But out of that Ninth Circuit decision, we have some valuable information um, for those of us here in Washington as well. One of the things the court talked about is what constitutes comparable work when we're talking about equal pay, right? You've got to look at comparators. You've got to decide what other people in your workforce are the ones that we're going to be comparing the claimant to. And and the Ninth Circuit told us that that is a broad analysis. We are not going to only look at a narrow swath of people that, that do the exact same job as the claimant. We're going to look at the overall job, not the individual components. In, in Ms. Freyd's case, the university argued that, wait a minute, these professors might all be tenured professors in psychology, but they teach different classes. They do different research. They're on different committees. The court said, no, no, no. They are all tenured professors in the same department just because their research might differ somewhat or they might teach a different class. It doesn't matter. So the takeaway there is comparators are broad. Another takeaway potentially are retention bonuses or retention raises inherently problematic. You know, as I mentioned, the difference there in men and women seeking those is not just at um, 
institutes of higher education. So uh, retention bonuses could be fertile ground for disparate impact claims. I want to um, just touch briefly on the NLRA, and that is just to let our, our folks know that under the current administration, we're seeing much more employee-friendly analysis under the NLRA. So where that really kind of trickles down on a practical level is looking at policies that you may have that might preclude employees from engaging in discussions about working conditions, their pay, what they can disclose on social media. Under Washington's Equal Pay and Opportunities Act, you're not supposed to be prohibiting employees from disclosing that kind of information, but we expect to be seeing more enforcement of those kinds of things. 